Mike, thank you so much for the time. How you doing today? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Congratulations on, I guess, trip number two to headline at the Comedy Mothership. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. Rave, rave reviews since opening a little bit more than a year ago. What was your first experience like here in Austin, opening at Joe or uh, headlining at Joe Rogan's place? It was unreal. It was packed. It was uh, it was pretty nuts, man. Uh, it's like the perfect club. He he designed. You could tell it was designed by a comic. Like every like little thing that we think of, it's like he's got it. You know what I mean? It's like down to the um, the the light in the green room when the previous comic is lit that light goes off so it's like you can you can know that he's lit uh in the green room without somebody telling you do you guys have a blue star in the green room as well because that's what lets the comics know that their time is up on stage i think it is yeah i think it's blue i'm not i can't be certain but i i can't remember exactly but i know that there's like a signal in there and it's like start making your way to the stage it's it seems like a little thing to lay people, but to us, it's like that's like an example of a of a huge thing that you you don't have to like worry about like where is he at time wise? Is somebody going to come back and get me? It's like it's taken care of. You're a New York City guy, right? Yeah, I'm here now. Where did you start out? Started in Philadelphia. Um, another I another Philly guy, man. Some cold blooded murderers come from that city, don't they? Uh, it's a good, it's a good place. Back when I started, it was not that many clubs. It was the Laugh House where I started from, which is where Kevin Hart came from, Big J, Kurt Metzger, like those three guys were like the class before me and they started coming to New York, you know, before I even got there. And then me and Joe DeRosa were around doing open mics and Thursday nights around the same time hosting and doing you know started featuring and then joe moved joe moved in with jay up here mm. and then uh, he came back to the club one weekend he's like what are you still doing because i was getting better he's like what are you still doing here move you got to move that was the advice back then it's like you do your little three years or three and a half years you move as far as you can in the club in your city and then you move to new york or la how big of an adjustment was that for you well, I had never, unlike other people, like I think Jay and some of these other guys, they, they like did trips from Philly to try to get on in New York and then came home. Like they did like went up, you know, and crashed on couches and then came home, you know, whatever. I didn't do any of that. I was like, I, I'm like, oh, if I'm going to do this, I'm just going to do it. And then, and then whatever happens happens like what you know if i bottom out and nothing i'll just be in new york uh, what's bad about that i could be in i'll just be in new york i'll live in new york and i'll get a job and i'll do something in new york it's a great place so that was my thinking going in i'm like if i fail i'll just be in new york worst case scenario i'll be in new york did you have a backup plan in terms of a profession i was a teacher before okay I didn't start till I was 28. I'm 51 now. So I, I um, was a teacher and I was finishing up my master's. Uh, I had gone through a bad breakup and I was um, finishing my master's. And I remember thinking, wow, I got to like figure something else out with my time. So I started going to open mics. I started hitting open mics and at first, I wasn't funny. And I was like, well, this is going to help me public speaking wise. It's going to help me in some capacity. So I'm just going to keep doing it. And it's a thing too, too, when you go through a, a bad breakup or a bad time in your life where you're like, I just kind of don't care what people think. <laughs> I just don't care. Like you, you kind of have a thing where it's like, I, I, I don't even care. You, you lose a little bit of that, um, s not self-awareness, but like pride or whatever it is that keeps you from doing fearful things. So I just kept just kept doing it. And then about three, three and a half years, in, I started getting consistently good. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, I started doing consistently well. So I was like, well, maybe there's something here. And then I was 31 at the time. My life circumstances, I was alone. I was didn't care for the job that I was in. I was going to make a move that way. And I was like, why don't I just make the move? It's, if this is, you know, 
this is the time to do it. I don't have a family. I'm not putting anybody at, you know, if you have a family of kids, you have to go about it differently. But I was like, no family of my own. And uh, I have an opportunity here and I can always go back to teaching if I really want to. And um, let me take a calculated risk. So that's what I did. Was there something epiphanous or revelatory that helped you to become more consistently funny after those three years? Um, I remember it's clearly a matter of you continuing not to care. No, you you don't care and you stay consistent with it. It's like, oh, I bombed tonight. And 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 the the instinct is like, I don't want to go up again. Like, forget this. Maybe I'm just not good at this. I just kind of stayed in the cut, like. I don't care if I'm not good at this. Maybe I don't, maybe, it, maybe I'm not, I know I'm not going to be a big stand up star. Like I'm just going to, I'll just keep doing this and it'll help me with public speaking. If nothing, at the very least, it'll help me with public speaking, but I did enjoy doing it. So I, I kept, I would prepare for my sets every night. And then if I um, failed or whatever didn't work, I would just like, okay, that's, I scrap those jokes. And then, through through the through line is like getting better on stage also feeling more comfortable feeling like yourself handling different situations like i'm like this is this is good for me in some way maybe i'm not going to be a big star but like this is good for me in some capacity i'm overcoming a fear i'm learning a skill it's like these are good things and maybe th this will help me down down the road with education because i was really committed to like ed education so it's like maybe this will help me yeah, that, that's a really way to think about doing something hard. It, it's the whole idea of pursuing your dreams and why it's good for you. It's not even necessarily always good for you right? because you achieve that dream, although you have achieved that dream. You are a, a stand-up comedian and nothing else now, so congratulations on that. But pursuing those dreams can help you to realize other dreams at the same time, too. And maybe early on, as you were trying to really find your footing and find your voice— the fact that you were putting yourself through something hard and overcoming that fear and you were able to rationalize it because it did, there was a relation to uh, your job as a teacher. It just helped to fuel you. So kudos to you for having a healthy mindset early on and uh, getting to that ultimate mountaintop, I guess. Now, what kind of teacher were you before you uh, ultimately quit the, t the profession? I was a special education teacher. Oh, wow. I with emotional and behavioral problems. And I taught middle school mostly but then in the end, I taught high school and I had a very first year I was there. I did really well with the kids and I, I you know, they were they were tough, but I um, worked. I brought a new program in and worked the program and a couple of kids really bought in. And I ended up having a very good relationship with them. Even after post-graduation, we stayed friends. They were like they were very uh, appreciative. But the next class coming up, fucked the system a little bit and fought me, really fought me on it. And, uh, and as a result, like the, it, the administration kind of came down on me a little bit. And I, at the end of the year, they're like, we have to like talk and you have to start doing things the way we want you to do it. I go, that's just, I didn't agree with them that they were doing the right things. So, um, you know, it was kind of like a reprimand situation. And I just was like, you don't have to reprimand me. I'll just resign. So I, I ended up resigning and, uh, and then everything kind of like, you know, you're looking back on it, everything kind of like uh, fell into place where it's like I resigned, I moved and I came up here to like to try to try stand up, really give it. I mean, really try. You know, Dude, That is crazy. I was going to uh, congratulate you for dodging what the school system has become over the last four to five yeah. years now with how COVID broke. Everything. I mean, it was the, I'm, I was just watching today. They have a whole thing on YouTube about why I quit teaching. And these teachers are on there and it's like what they're saying was the tip of the iceberg that I saw where parents, you know, it was a wealthier district, but like different districts have different challenges, you know, socioeconomically. And it was a wealthier district. And the, the parents really put pressure on the administrators and the administrators were like were very much like hey, we have to we can't get sued. We have to like, you know, kind of like do what the parents are saying. And I'm like, well, then why did I get a master's in this? I don't, you know, why did I go to college for this and, and get all these degrees and stuff if they're just going to come in and muscle us? And I'm, I was listening to it today. It's like, that was the tip of the iceberg with what happened. And I have to say this, this is very ironic, funny. 
I just did a show in Delaware about a month ago, and it was close to the where I taught in Pennsylvania, 20 minutes away. All the kids that I taught 20 years later showed up. They showed up, they got a table, and they watched my set. And the first thing I said uh, out of the gates of my set, it's like, I was a teacher here. I taught this group of kids at this table. And I have to tell you, I am couldn't be more pleased. They've been, they were trying to get out of my class the entire year. And now they each paid $35 for a ticket to come and see me. That makes me the happiest I've ever been. Knowing that they had to pay $35 when they were trying to get out of my class for a full year. <laughs> So yeah, it it, it, made, it really made me laugh. It made them laugh. I talked to all of them. Uh, some of their parents were there. Administrators were there, and it was all good, you know. That's but so they, cool. but the, the, even the kids were saying, "I'm like," the kids were saying, the kids who gave me the hardest time were saying, and they were there, and they said, "We're glad we we're glad you got out. We're glad you got out. We hated like I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for the trouble we caused you, but I'm glad that you are doing something else." Boy, speaking of mountaintops, my goodness, man! I mean that that hits the that hits. It the... was really something. It was, it was literally one month ago, literally a month ago, and they, you know, because I've had some some kids come to other shows, but I've never had them all together, and and some of them I haven't seen since uh, since I stopped working there. So they all came together, and um, most of them, and uh, you know, saw them, got to talk to them, got to see how they were doing, and it was uh, it was really a. Because you, a lot of times in life, when you're in something, you can't see the totality of it. You're just not, you're not at a perspective where you could see the totality of it. So that when after that night, I was like, this is, and I go to other dates and stuff, but I was like, this is pretty special. Well, you can never predict the future for a variety of reasons. One being you're only one person. So how much of an impact are you going to make on an individual, much less a group of individuals? So right. for that group to have come together to go support you to go along with maybe other teachers or school administrators. That's uh, a yeah. well, talk, talk about proof positive that if you had gone with that other route, that other career, you probably would have been okay too, even though you had to. Yeah, because there's up. always a way through. There's always a way, there's always a way through. I mean, th there's a thing where it's like, well, if you would have been teaching, it's, it, it would have been miserable. It's like, no, if you know, you, there's responsibility in it. If I would have kept teaching, I would have taken that, on and you know if i would have become bitter then that would have been my choice to become bitter not to say that there weren't there aren't things that make you bitter and there aren't uh, factors and stuff that 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 can turn you but it's like your responsibility to make the best of the situation and not to become bitter and not to become angry because it you know it, it makes things worse so i don't want to make any assumptions here but if you're a philly guy are you a philly sports fan too Yes, because when I moved, I'm originally from Northeast Ohio, and then uh, I spent half in Youngstown, Ohio, which is a steel town, was a steel town. And uh, and then I moved, we moved to Florida, Boca Raton as a family, then back to Ohio and then back to Florida. So I spent half, half and half, half the time in Youngstown, Ohio and half in Florida, and I have great experiences in both places. But then I moved, I went to Penn State University, and I moved to, to uh, Philly uh, with a girl that I was with, she's from that area. And I moved there, uh, in 95, 1995, and there was no satellite television. So we lived downtown and it's like, you watch whatever team you watch, whatever team is on. And, and it was the Eagles. So I became a huge Eagles fan. So Philly fans have a reputation. What's the most messed up thing you've ever seen out of Philly fans before? Um, yeah, I just remember it being like you can't wear a different jersey in the um, stadium. I had a friend of mine who who was a cop at the time. He's a Pittsburgh, like he's a Steelers fan, but he went to the Eagles game, support, you know, Eagles, whatever. And uh, he went in the bathroom and had like two Eagles fans were beating up a guy who had another jersey on in the state, to, like pull them off of him. And it's like. I mean, I'm all for spirit and fun and everything, but 
I mean, when it gets to that point, it's not really even about sports anymore. It's yeah. about something else that's going on inside of you. And you're using that as a mechanism to take out your anger. But um, yeah, there's some of that there. There's some of that with uh, with not just Eagles fans, but with, you know, football fans in general. But, you know, other the, the opposing fans can be antagonistic also. You know what I mean? It's not all one sided. So it's like. But but most of the people, I'd say the overwhelming majority are like good, just good wanting to have fun people. You know, you get the psychos and that's what makes the news. But, you know, gosh, thinking about your time in Happy Valley, you were there during some uh, fruitful times for Joe Pod, too, if I'm remembering correctly, late 80s, early 90s. Um, I was there the same year, the year I graduated. It was uh, we had three guys go in the first round. Damn. Yeah, we had uh, Kerry Collins, Kijana Carter, and uh, Kyle Brady all went in the first round. Oh, Kijana uh, was such a good running back. Oh, so good. With the From big, Ohio. Right? So good. And and I met him before. My roommate was friends with him. He was a nice oh. guy. Too. He was a great guy. Yeah. But he was, a, I mean, Rush. Rasan, I don't know if I'm saying his first name. Rasan Salam. Sean Salam, yeah, from Colorado. He, he, yeah, he won the Heisman. Yep. But I mean, Kijana was, in my opinion, just no disrespect. God rest his soul, Rashad Salam. But uh, but Kijana was the best. He was unreal. He would just line yards from scrimmage were just insane. Well, I'm a Longhorns fan, and Rashawn Salam lit us up a couple of years, if I'm remembering correctly, definitely one year. But he also had Cord Cordell Stewart as his quarterback, too. It's yeah, not yeah, like yeah. Kerry yeah. Collins, for as good of a thrower as he was, was that fleet of foot. Kajano was having to do all the work on the ground on his own. Right, right. We had a great team. I mean, I think we were number two in Colorado. And that was when the polls were, but it was unde we were undefeated, I think. I, I'm not, I can't remember really, but we were, like, I think undefeated. But number we 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 ended up number two in the rankings. Do you ever go back to Happy Valley now? I uh, well, I went back years ago for a show. Okay. It was a benefit show at State College Theater. It was great, and uh, and then recently, not within the last couple years, uh, Nate Bargatze is a friend of mine, and uh, we came up together, and he's killing it. He's like selling out arenas now but back then he was we went and did the bryce jordan i went to the bryce jordan center with him and it was i mean fantastic got to hang out got to walked around the town you know they it's just very it's a huge school but it's it seems like a small town because mm -hmm. i remember all the different spots we used to go to and where i lived and all that stuff it's fun it was fun yeah, I've heard Ann Arbor with University of Michigan, of course, is a lot like that, too. Is it? I heard it because Ohio State is like, I heard Ohio State is huge. It's just humongous. Like, yeah. Happy Valley's not really like that. That's the beauty of it. It's a, it's, it's, it's a college town in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's just, it's very, it's very small. Yeah, University of Texas is probably more like Ohio State than it is Michigan because you can... You can be in Austin and not get anywhere near the campus. Now, if you're on a certain highway, you'll see the campus and you'll see the right. football stadium and whatnot. But Austin has grown so big at this point. I mean, shoot, it used to be the live music capital of the world, and now it's turning into a comedy capital of the world. So yeah. there's lots of different worlds that you can choose to reside in if you want to, or none yeah. of them at all, I guess. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's supposed to be a great place to live. I don't know. Was there guys, the guys rave about it. The guys who've moved there rave about it. Yeah, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think of the Philly guys who are here now. Matt and Shane are obviously here. They have uh, some Philly roots. So people who have moved here tend to love it. It does have a bit of a small town feel at times too, especially as compared to like a New York or Chicago or something. But again, there's enough going on that I think you could probably separate yourself if you really want to. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I've never been, I've been downtown, obviously I've done uh, Joe's club before, but it, it's um, the suburbs. There must be great suburbs out there too. You know, that yeah, my, yeah, my, fam my family lives in the suburbs. I've got a wife and a nine and seven year old. And so we live in Cedar park. It's a Northwest suburb and it's great because we're close enough to the highway that if we want to go experience a city, food, nightlife, comedy shows, whatever, it's a 20 to 25 minute drive. It's reasonable to drive downtown still, unlike 
the New Yorks and the Chicago's of the world, San Francisco, something like that. So you can park for a moderate price or you can Uber it down there and you're not going to break the bank doing so. But you also get to escape the BS as well. And you're not uh, you're not having to make like an hour long commute just to do that. Uh, so I, I dig it. I I moved, I lived in Austin going to school at UT and then living there for a decade, pursuing a career in broadcasting before moving away to Oregon, then Chicago, and then back to Austin now for almost another decade. And it's a very different city than it was when I started I there in the mid 1990s in a good way though. And look, long people who are longtime Austin people gripe because there are a lot of new faces in the right, right. there's a lot of new things and there's some cool old stuff that is no longer around as a result of competition just being priced out whatever else it is but that inevitably happens with cool places they they evolve and things change things are going to change regardless but in most cases i think austin is changing for the better now it is losing a little bit of its weirdness but that's why it's important for those who live here and move here recognize the need and Part of the weirdness is embracing the mom and pop culture, but part of it is also a sort of sharing of ideas, right? Where you don't necessarily need to agree with what somebody is saying to have a conversation with them. And it doesn't need to devolve into name calling either. I think that's one of the reasons why Rogan's obviously a big reason here too. But one of the reasons why comedy has taken such a stranglehold over Austin is because Austin is a very open-minded place. It's considered a progressive city, but it's surrounded by conservative Texas. But even though it's a progressive city, it's a progressive city where you get a lot of people coming together for civic debate. Debate, And that's something that we lost a few years ago that I do feel like is starting to come back now. And stand-up comedy and the popularity of stand-up comedy, I think is uh, uh, the one of the big reasons why it is now entering another sort of golden era is because people were craving contentious issues or taboo issues being talked about in a way that wasn't necessarily going to offend everybody. Of course, somebody's going to be offended by certain things, uh, just yeah. about anything that you bring up. But when a comedian's doing it right, typically you guys are hitting both sides of an issue. And at the end of the day, we can we can look at one another, even if we may have a, a general disagreement over that issue and just shake our heads and laugh at the the absurdity of it all. Yeah, that's the right thing. That's the right thing to do. Because, you know, as a comedian, you're up there, regardless of what they're doing, they're doing it to make the crowd laugh. Yeah. And I think it loses something like, especially online, you know, if people think, you know, I'll, I'll have jokes and we'll all have jokes posted and you, you, you'll have people comment and argue the joke. They're arguing the joke. Like you're giving a speech on a topic. It's like, I'm not, this is all just, you know, fun. And because the thing is there's a kernel of truth in there. Yeah. So it's they just they but but the Internet is the Wild West. So they're just on there and they're going they're going. No, I disagree with this. It's like you're disagreeing with a joke. You're disagreeing with a joke. You know that. Right. It's like, you know, you're taking your time out of your day to write that you've disagreed with this joke. So it's kind of it's kind of nuts. But at live shows, most people get what you're doing. They, they get. Yeah, there, there is an adjustment that you guys are having to uh, uh, to deal with, though, because uh, social media has made comedians much more popular. But in doing so, there's like a an enabling of the uh, the rookies who go to a comedy show who think the entire show is about you yelling stuff out to the comedian. Right, right, right. Just shutting up until the comedian addresses you directly. And then at that point, it is your cue to uh, to talk if you want to. Well, because the, what they're seeing online is these crowd work clips. And I understand why comics put it, are putting out crowd work clips is because, you know, they're trying to sell tickets and it's like these clips do very well. And but then the lay person goes on and sees the clips and goes, oh, that's must that must be how you act at a comedy club. That must be how it is. So they go there and they do that. They probably had a few drinks and they go do that. And they think many times in many cases they think they're helping. You know, but, but it's like we have an act. Most people have an act when they go up and it's like that is, uh, you know, disruptive. Right. Well, uh, Mike, thank you so much for the time today. People cannot buy tickets to go see you this weekend because gosh, your shows have been sold out for at least a week, if not more. But I am going to encourage people to go to your website, MikeVecchione.com. It's where they can see your latest stand up. Can, I, special, the can I plug my social media also? Oh, please do. 
Yeah, it's just Comic Mike V. If you guys go to Comic Mike V, I'm on um, Instagram, obviously, TikTok, Twitter. Um, I have a long Italian last name that's confusing to people. But uh, Comic Mike V is where you can find me. And uh, I have dates and all that stuff coming up. So Comic Mike V, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to try and spell your last name off the top of my head because it'll help people get to your website too. V-E-C-C-H-I-O-N-E. Nailed it. You get a free trip to Naples, Italy. <laughs> if you spell it. Mike, congratulations, man, on the uh, on the success. I love hearing about what happened a month ago and really, really do appreciate the time. Hopefully this isn't the last time you and I get to speak. No problem. Thanks for having me on. You're on YouTube right now. I'd greatly appreciate you subscribing to Books on Pod if you have not already and click thumbs up if you liked the episode. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thanks to you for hanging out. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. Talk to you next time on Books on Pod. Thank you.